Hello and welcome to our Week 5 Supplemental Lecture on Richard Wolin's Answer to the Question, What is Counter-Enlightenment? The title of this piece should remind you of the Kant answer to the question, What is Enlightenment? that we read earlier in the term, and also Foucault's response to that piece. Wolin is going to write a critique of postmodernists and post-structuralists. He's going to talk about a couple of people that we've read a little bit. He's going to talk about Foucault and Lyotard, and he's going to talk about some people we haven't met yet in the course, Derrida and Deleuze in particular. And he's going to say that these are figures that are commonly assumed to be associated with the academic or intellectual left. He's going to say that they're drawing on intellectual resources that historically would have been more closely associated with the right. And he's going to question what that's about. Why is this going on? And in some ways, this is almost the anti-Lazordo, for those of you who read the Lazordo piece a couple of weeks back. Um, it has a similar kind of affect in the sense that it's going to try to uncover every embarrassing thing that it possibly can about the theorists that he's criticizing, but its political valence, the conclusion it's trying to come to, is quite different to the one Lazzaro was trying to come to. So you might enjoy playing these two off against one another. So he starts with a question about what's the relationship between Enlightenment and the left. And this is an intervention rather than a historical discussion. So not everyone's going to understand the left this way. Not everyone's going to understand Enlightenment this way. Not everyone's going to have the same image of the relationship between these two things. Wolin is trying to define the left in relation to Enlightenment in a particular way. It is a political intervention. And he says that the Enlightenment, and here he's got in mind the 18th century French Enlightenment in particular, he doesn't seem to deal with the Scottish Enlightenment or some of the other figures that we've looked at that we would think about in terms of political economy or some of the political figures we've looked at as well. But he says advocates of the Enlightenment saw themselves as a party of humanity representing the general will rather than some particular standpoints. And again, we began looking at standpoint theories of various kinds last week. He says, they opposed reason to dogma, superstition, and unwarranted social authority. He says, they started as political moderates, but they were driven by the attempt to reform monarchy. And when monarchy proved itself unreformable, they shifted and shifted and shifted and ended up in a democratic, republican position. He says, when on June 27, 1789, the deputies representing the Third Estate, whose members had been bred on Enlightenment precepts, took their seats in the National Assembly on the left side of the hall, the modern political left was born. So for those of you who didn't know that story, where our left and right categories come from. And then he talks about the counter-enlightenment and the right. He says, of course, the same sequence of events precipitated the birth of the modern political right, whose adherents elected to sit on the opposite side of the Versailles Assembly Hall on that fateful day in 1789. And he talks about the counter-enlightenment and offers a concept of counter-enlightenment, and he explicitly here plays off against Isaiah Berlin, if you read that piece earlier in the term. He says, the counter-enlightenment frequently appealed to theological arguments. It expressed concerns about hubris, he says, about pride, about the possible misuse of reason, about worries that if you let reason have free play, you'll end up with you know, corruption of morals and disorder, concerned with the preservation of order, and characterized by an opposition to self-governance, a mistrust of the masses and what would happen if you let them lead themselves by reason. And he notes that Isaiah Berlin makes the connection between counter-enlightenment and fascism, and he thinks that there's a valid connection there to be made, but notes that while the counter-enlightenment specifically was trying to resist social change, fascism doesn't have that characteristic. It is a revolutionary movement. It is aiming at transformation, but it's aiming at the transformation to an alternative conception of modernity, not the conception driven by the Enlightenment. And this distinction is going to become important for Wollen because he thinks that it's important to realize that you can have movements that are on the right that are not about preserving what is or preserving the past. So if he's going to look at postmodernism and poststructuralism and argue they have the characteristics of the counter-enlightenment, he has to be able to deal with the fact that they're not exactly traditionalist movements.
And then he talks about anti-enlightenment in the left. He says he's been quite startled to see that the academic left, and he's careful to differentiate it, there are other kinds of left that he doesn't have a quarrel with. But components of the academic left using anti-enlightenment critiques that are more normally historically associated with the right. He says, one finds champions of postmodernism who proudly invoke the counter-enlightenment heritage as their own. He's particularly disturbed by critiques of democracy that are sourced from counter-enlightenment texts and claims that these sorts of critiques of democracy can be rebadged and used for left-wing purposes while well, and is dubious whether this is a good idea. Uh, he thinks that it's one thing to say that there are deficiencies or limitations in current forms of democracy. It's quite another to think that those deficiencies can be addressed by borrowing from critics who are hostile to democracy itself. And this is something that will recur when we move into our politics theme. Wallen is a pivot figure that raises a lot of the issues that will come up again later in the term. He says, yet those who advocate this alliance of convenience between extreme right and extreme left provide few guarantees or assurances that the end product will result in greater freedom rather than a grandiose political miscarriage. He talks about Nietzsche and Heidegger as inspirations for the French left and specifies that he's thinking particularly about Derrida, Foucault and Deleuze. Now he'll treat these figures differently and the figures are quite different in terms of their explicit relationship to the Enlightenment. But he says that you get a, a burst of theory around the same time in the 60s because of a particular situation in France, a particular constellation of historical circumstances that then strangely gets imported into the left a decade or two later and decontextualized from this very specific French situation and ironically moves over into English-speaking countries at the point that it's dying away in France as the political configuration that gave birth to it is also changing. So he says, during the 1960s, Spindlerian indictments of Western civilization, once cultivated by leading representatives of the German intellectual right, migrated across the Rhine, where they gained new currency. And we'll take a look at Spindler when we talk about our political topics. Spindler was also someone that Connell was discussing in week one. So the issue of universalism and humanism, and this came up a bit in Foucault's response to Kant that we discussed earlier in the term, but Wallen is saying that universalism and humanism were foundational Enlightenment values and that they have been under fire by French structuralism and then post-structuralism, which is its inheritor that attempts to radicalize that tradition. If you read the Stuart Hall, you would have heard me talking a bit about structuralism and post-structuralism then. If you didn't read that piece, you can go back and revisit that lecture from week two and get a bit of background on these movements. But Levi-Strauss, who is a foundational figure for structuralism, makes a case, according to Wollen, that human rights, the concept of human rights, are intrinsically bound to Western notions of humanism and universalism. Wollen says he espouses a kind of cultural relativism that even goes so far in places as to suggest that one should ban cross-cultural communication in order to maximally preserve cultural diversity. Now, whether this is entirely fair as a representation, again, is something that would be debated. Wallen makes an insinuation here that this sort of desire to preserve cultures in some kind of pristine way is reminiscent of miscegenation fears, of fears of interbreeding between races. Uh, and again, this is a highly tendentious way of characterizing this sort of position. Well, in contrast, what he calls a humanist value of tolerance to cultural relativism. He says tolerance is based on the fundamental respect for human integrity. But relativism, Wallen says, when combined with an anti-humanist inspired Western self-hatred, engendered an uncritical third worldism. And what he has in mind there were support given for particular kinds of third world political movements, and he particularly mentions the Iranian Revolution and Foucault's support of it, that he regards as uncritical acceptance of political movements that were actually oppressive in character, that were supported just because they seemed anti-Western, and anti-Western was understood as something worth attacking. Wallen says, history to these people appeared as a senseless fate 
devoid of rhyme or reason, consigned a priori to the realm of unintelligibility. And those of you who read Isaiah Berlin on the Counter-Enlightenment will remember some of this same kind of discussion. This conception of history for Wallen denigrates the human capacities of consciousness and will. So there is this idea that one has a value of the human and of human consciousness, of human worth, and that this is a benchmark value that is prior to the constitution of the state and puts some checks on the state. And this is understood to be universal in character, and Wallen believes this is an important political conception to secure against totalitarian forms of government. And again, this anticipates some of the things that we'll be talking about when we shift to the politics theme next week. And then he talks about Foucault, and this is a different Foucault than we've read so far for the course. Uh, and he talks about a work called Madness and Civilization that does conclude with, as Wallen phrases it, praise for the sovereign enterprise of unreason, which can't be reduced to some kind of curable illness. And he complains about Foucault. This is something that you probably can see a little bit of in Discipline and Punish, which we did read a couple of weeks ago. Presenting reason as a mechanism of oppression that proceeds by way of exclusions, constraints, and prohibitions. And he says that even Derrida, trying to criticize Foucault, seems to basically accept that this is the terrain that we're operating on. And then he talks about Lyotard, and he talks about Lyotard equating consensus with terror. He says, the idea of an uncoerced, rational accord, argu argues Lyotard, is a fantasy, underlying the veneer of mutual agreement lurks force. This endemic cynicism about linguistically adjudicating disputes is another one of post-structuralism's hallmarks. Okay, so that's a sort of, that's a mouthful of a sentence. But what he's saying is that there are figures, Habermas would be one in the contemporary frame, uh, who talks about the fact that we can try to achieve some kind of consensus. We can try to talk to each other. We can try to give reasons for what we're doing. We can try to persuade each other. And this historically is embodied in things like social contract theory, in notions that rights come from some sort of process of mutual agreement. And that notion of social contract continues up to contemporary forms of theory like Habermas. The French tradition is quite suspicious of this, is worried about forms of force that are disguised by the claims to social contract. And Wallen is suggesting that Although there is this cynicism about this, this criticism of it, there's a kind of what's often called a performative contradiction underlying this, because although these people are saying that they are skeptical of the notion of mutual agreement and attempting to reach consensus and the rest, nevertheless they're writing an argument, they're trying to persuade people, and this is sort of acting as though this kind of uncoerced agreement is possible, while at the same time there's a denial of uncoerced agreement in the political realm. Wollen says, one cannot help but wonder how Lyotard expects to convince readers of the rectitude of his position, if not by a recourse to time-honored discursive means, the marshalling of supporting evidence and the force of the better argument. If, as Lyotard insinuates, force is all there is, on what grounds might we prefer one position to another? Now, how much this kind of argument stings is going to depend a lot on exactly what someone's doing with their critique of social contract theory. There is a long-standing critique of social contract theory that says that there are areas of social life where people have formally free and formally equal ability to come together, but where structurally there's a great deal of unfreedom or inequality and that this scars the kind of agreement people can come to. Marx makes this kind of criticism when he's talking about the employment contract. So you have two formally free, formally equal in law contracting parties, but one one of them is going to starve if they don't work, and the other one can hire somebody else. Uh, and Marx says, so this is formal uh, equality, but that equality is not substantive, and so the, the formal structure of that particular social contract disguises an underlying inequality. Lyotard starts life as a Marxist of a particular sort. There's a good chance that what, that's what he has in mind, is that discussion in Marx, when he's talking about problems of consensus. Um, Wolin is generalizing the point, 
And it's not an entirely unfair generalization, because some of the theory in this space does act as though it is a more general, less bounded critique. But how reasonable you think either Wollen or Lyotard is being depends on how you interpret the claims that are being made. And then Wollen talks about the strange receptiveness to postmodernism, or what he thinks is the strange receptiveness to it, that you get this translation of French theorists into English in the 70s and 80s, and it provokes an enormous shift. He's particularly concerned with the US, but it happens in other English-speaking countries at this time as well. And he's puzzled how it happens. He says many of these texts were inspired by Nietzsche's anti-civilizational animus, the conviction that our highest ideals of beauty, morality, and truth were intrinsically nihilistic. Such views found favor among a generation of academics disillusioned by the political failures of the 60s. Understandably, in despondent times, Nietzsche's iconoclastic recommendation that one should philosophize with a hammer, that if something is falling, one should give it a final push, found a ready echo. Yet too often, those who rushed to mount the Nietzschean bandwagon downplayed or ignored the illiberal implications of his position. So Wollens giving a sort of historical cultural reason there might have been some receptiveness. Coming off of the 60s, there were very high hopes for radical political change. Those hopes get done away with. There's a massive political reaction. Revolutionary movements that looked like they were going to have some purchase, that looked like they were going to make some dramatic changes, get squashed. They go away. And in that period of relative disempowerment, Wallen thinks that these sort of Nietzschean ideals have some appeal. There's a cynicism about what's possible. There is a feeling that there might be a, a hypocrisy of existing social institutions. So Wallen says, we can kind of understand why this might happen, but at the same time, when it happened, people were not sufficiently critical of the way in which Nietzsche or related philosophical positions are fundamentally anti-liberal in orientation, and Wollen does not think that is a good thing. Wollen also says that while you can understand this in terms of the defeat of radical politics, it also helps accentuate that defeat. It shifts people to textual politics, which displaces energy from radical politics, by which Wollen means politics that's trying to contest and change social institutions. So Wollen says, while Republicans were commandeering the nation's political apparatus, partisans of theory were storming the ramparts of the Modern Language Association and the local English department. So Wallen doesn't think these are worthy political goals. Uh, it's also a bit harsh uh, in terms of what the actual possibilities for political change might have been in the periods when these things were happening. And then he talks about the fact that you have a, a sort of historical irony, that the point that this, this 1960s era French theory is being picked up in the English-speaking world, uh, it's being rejected in France in its origin point. And Wallen says that this happens because there's a renewed engagement with anti-totalitarian politics, particularly engaging with dissident intellectuals who are writing about the Soviet Union. There's a rejection of what Wallen calls third worldism, so there's a recognition that just because a revolution is happening outside the core doesn't mean it's necessarily emancipatory. Something can be anti-Western and can be repressive. The West is not the only place that has political problems. And as a consequence of these, Wallen says, you get a re-engagement with humanism and democratic republicanism in France, but these anti-humanist forms of philosophy are spreading into the English-speaking world, decontextualized from the situation in France in which they emerged. He says, during the 1960s, the post-structuralists sought to supplement Marx with more radical critiques of civilization set forth by Nietzsche and Heidegger. Their indictments of Western humanism seemed well suited to the apocalyptical mood of the times, framed by the war in Vietnam and the reigning superpower nuclear strategy of mutually assured destruction. So again, the time seemed sort of crazy. So adopting a philosophy that emphasizes the irrationality and purposelessness of history, the meaninglessness of historical trajectory, it didn't seem a huge mismatch for its period. The experience of totalitarianism, however, which remained a reality in Eastern Europe until 1989, suggested that the idea of human rights had become the sine qua non of progressive politics. So in spite of the cynicism with which you might view the time, 
the idea that there are bedrock human rights that transcend the power of the state, that transcend the state's ability to establish its own legitimacy, human rights as the basis for the legitimacy of power. This is clearly still for Wolin a bedrock political value, regardless of other things that are going on in the world, and totalitarianism is one of the things that shows that that's the case. And then he says the other thing that happens in France, aside from just a sensitivity to the issue of totalitarianism, is a series of scandals relating to figures that are associated with post-structuralism and deconstruction. And he talks particularly about the discovery that some figures associated with the movements in their past had been involved with various kinds of anti-Semitic writings and an ongoing debate about the Nazi affiliations of Heidegger, who is a major theoretical, philosophical figure underlying each of these French theorists' work. And then he asks the question, how accurate is it to call postmodernism a movement of the left? And he says, well, to answer this, you've got to look at what the left historically has been. And he gives a very optimistic view of the historical left and a very specific view of it. And this is actually the kind of view that Lozordo is going after. So again, these two pieces can be played off against one another, interestingly, if you would like to do that. Wollen says, historically, the left has been staunchly rationalist and universalist, defending democracy, egalitarianism, and human rights. One of the hallmarks of the political left has been a willingness to address questions of social justice, systematically calling into question parochial definitions of liberty that sanction vast inequalities of wealth, demanding instead that proponents of formal equality meet the needs of socially disadvantaged groups. Time and again, the left has forced bourgeois society to live up to democratic norms, challenging individualistic conceptions of rights as well as the plutocratic ambitions of political and economic elites. Thus, if one examines the developmental trajectory of modern societies, one discerns a fitful progression from civic to political to social equality. Okay, so there's a trajectory there, a trajectory within liberalism as driven by the left. Okay? And interestingly, Wolin also talks about the distinction between formal equality and substantive equality. He's not happy resting with formal equality. Um, he wants to talk about social disadvantage and rectify social disadvantage as a precondition for meaningful real equality. Some of the other figures that we'll read this week do want to stop at formal equality. To them, that's what the left is about. And all of this other contestation around the margins is watering down that goal and asking for more than, uh, than what fits within the category of the universal. So there are tensions within this section, within the authors in this topic this week, uh, even though they're all going to be on the same side, so to speak, in the science wars, they define the left in different ways. But so having given this definition, Wallen says, well, where does postmodernism fit here? It's regarded as being on the left. He thinks that that's dubious, that it is not clearly aligned with the left in many, many specific ways. He attacks the fact that it is, he says, culturalist, and therefore concerns with social justice and political economy are marginalized. He says, in an age of globalization, when markets threaten to become destiny, this omission proves fatal to any theory that stakes a claim to political relevance. And he's, he'll return to this several times. He's extremely critical of the move to culture, of attacking culture rather than focusing on what he regards as more real world issues of social justice and political economy. And this will keep repeating. This is a concern that will repeat in everything that will do this term. He is disturbed by what he regards as a distrust of reason and democracy that he thinks is inherited from Nietzsche and Heidegger. He says, their denunciations of reason's inadequacies have an all too familiar ring. Since the dawn of the counter-enlightenment, they have been the standard fare of European reaction. So we've seen these critiques before, he thinks. It's just that they're not historically associated with the left. And he's very dubious about the idea that you can take these right-wing critiques of democracy and reason and do something with them that will be useful for left politics. He's worried that the level of abstraction 
with which these critiques articulate themselves lets capitalism off the hook. So it's not sufficiently applied, it's not directed toward concrete institutional change. He also finds it a fundamentally pessimistic form of theory, and the pessimism, he thinks, undermines political action. He says, after all, if, as Foucault claims, power is everywhere, to contest it seems pointless. And again, there are ways that Foucault could probably respond to that, and if you go back and take a look at Discipline and Punish, you may be able to work some of those out. Um, but it is the case that a lot of theory that comes out of the 60s and 70s is not talking about fundamental institutional transformation. It is talking about resistance, resisting power. There is a shortening of political goals in that period, but this is not specific to people like Foucault. You can see it even in works of people like Habermas that I don't think Wallen would have much of a quarrel with. Because there's something in that period that makes it no longer feel realistic to talk about fundamental transformations. And you can argue that we're still in a period now where that's quite difficult to do. Wallen worries that the celebration of difference and diversity that's part of these movements can become fetishistic and essentialist, that it is not as progressive necessarily as it thinks of itself as being. And he thinks that the suspicion that these theorists direct at consensus and at the ideal of consensus, which is understood as something that should be criticized because it suppresses difference, Wallen is worried that this makes it essentially impossible to work out how to form a political community. And then he picks on something, and again, we're going to keep seeing people pick on this as we move forward in the term. He picks on the narrow-minded focus, he calls, on group identity that has encouraged political withdrawal. And again, there's a, there are fights about this, uh, there are fights about identity politics, whether this is merely culturalist, whether this is exclusionary, whether this is something that is less serious than other forms of politics, with various groups arguing that actually their assertion of their identity is bound up in material demands and in institutional demands for institutional change. Uh, so we'll see this fought out again as well. But Wallen is very critical. He says, identity is not an argument. It represents an appeal to life or brute existence as opposed to principles that presuppose argumentative give and take. So he doesn't like the idea that you can just say, here's who I am, here is my standpoint, and you can't touch it. You're not in this standpoint itself. I am isolated from the contact of our shared experience. Wallen wants something more universal that can provide the basis for give and take. And again, he'll do sort of uh, all level of low blows in this. He talks about a conversation he has with someone from Germany who says, yes, you know, we, experience, we experimented with identity politics too, and he's talking about the Nazis. And then Wallen is disturbed by what he regards as a rejection of political modernity, a rejection of liberalism, is what he has in mind here. He says, paradoxically, whereas a visceral rejection of political modernity, the rights of man, the rule of law, constitutionalism, was once standard fare among counter-revolutionary thinkers, it's now become fashionable among advocates of the cultural left. Postmodernists now equate democracy with soft totalitarianism. They argue that by privileging public reason and the common good, liberal democracy effectively suppresses otherness and difference. Okay, and Wallen's not pleased with this line of argument. He thinks it's fundamentally not a left line of argument. He says, by denying the basic emancipatory potentials of democracy, by downplaying the significant differences between it and its totalitarian antithesis, the postmodern left has openly consigned itself to the political margin. So he thinks it's become a fringe political movement. For whatever their empirical failings, states predicated on rule of law contain a basic capacity for internal political change, fundamentally absent from illiberal political regimes. Over the last 40 years, the qualified successes of the women's, anti-war, ecological, civil, and gay rights movements have testified to this political rule of thumb. And this is an argument that we'll hit again when we move into our politics theme, the idea that there is at base, whatever the flaws, more of a possibility for contestation and successful political change in liberal governmental forms. And there's contestation over that. Not everyone will agree. But this is something we'll look into in much more detail when we move into our politics theme.
And then he talks again about the fact that there are some contextual grounds for this particular verdict to be drawn in France, specifically in a brief period of time under de Gaulle, uh, when he thinks that uh, it, it's a little dubious how democratic the governmental form in France actually is, but that when you take this kind of thought out of that context and you extrapolate it and make it as though it is a general philosophy, sort of general first principles, you do something very, very bizarre and Wallen thinks very, very damaging. Okay? And that brings us to the end of the portion of this chapter that was assigned for the course. He then goes on in subsequent pages to just summarize what he's going to do in the rest of the book. And those of you interested in writing an essay on this might want to take a look at that and see if you want to use any of his subsequent work.